This video will be walking you through the LJ Create presentation for Structure of Atoms with notation by me, the coolest guy ever. Okay, from this page, the most important information is that atoms are the smallest part of an element that can exist. What they mean by that is it's the smallest way you can break up an element and still have it retain the properties of those elements. So the metallic elements will still be magnetic, they'll still be ductile, they'll be malleable. All the properties of metals. If you break it down any smaller than that, it no longer has those properties of, uh, of that element that it's made of. And the uh, next part is the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons, collectively known as the subatomic particles. You'll hear both of those terms coming from me and Mr. Negrete and the star. Okay, that first little blurb, atoms are the building block of the entire universe. Anything that exists is made of atoms. That's all that means. If it's anything you can imagine, it's made of atoms. <laughs> Physical substances are composed of matter. Matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. <clears throat> matter is composed of elements. As we start off very broad and we're working our way down. So matter is composed of elements, which is made of atoms. Atoms are the smallest part. That's just a repetition of what I already told you. It's the smallest thing you can divide and still have the properties of that element. Next slide. At one point, they were thought to be solid little spheres. They're not. Uh, they're made of three small particles, the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. One more time, those are called the subatomic particles. Sub meaning below or underneath. Atomic meaning atoms. And particles meaning little things. So little things that are beneath the atoms. OK, this next page is about models. Whoops, too far. Now, they don't mean model like supermodel. They mean model like something used to represent something else. Atoms are way, way, way too small to be seen by your eye or even any microscope you'll likely ever come across in your entire life. So we use a model to draw it. There are some limitations to models, though, which I believe is the next slide. There we go. Advantages and disadvantages, good things and bad things. <clears throat> One of the good things about models is it lets us visualize something that otherwise would be very difficult to imagine. Like, the solar system is way too big to be seen all at once, so we use a model. Atoms, on the other hand, are way too small to be seen all at once, so we use a model. We have our nucleus in the middle, then we have these imaginary rings, those are the energy levels. Now, it doesn't actually exist like that. That's one of the disadvantages. An actual atom doesn't look like this. This is just a model we use to represent it. Next slide. Question. What is the name given to the smallest distinguishable unit of an element? Atom, molecule, particle, or matter? We're going to pause for a second. Right answer? Atom. Nailed it. Next page. Protons and neutrons are found in the middle of the, nu the atom, the nucleus. That's this part in the middle. That's the nucleus. It's the center. Now, here's another vocabulary word that you'll sometimes see on this star. Protons and neutrons together are called nucleons. Why? Because they're found in the nucleus. And this next part, very important. Electrons are much smaller than the nucleons and orbit, move around, the nucleus. They are much, much smaller. If you remember back in the lecture, it takes about two, almost 2,000 electrons to equal the mass of just one proton or neutron. They're very, very small, and they move around very, very quickly. They are never, ever found inside the nucleus. They're always outside. Oops, too far. This next part, the rest of the atom is empty space. Other than the nucleus and those tiny little dots of electrons, the atom is entirely empty. They just look solid because the electrons are moving so fast. The next analogy is pretty good. That if you imagine a full-size soccer field, the nucleus would be a soccer ball in the middle, the electrons would be going around the edge of the field, and everything else is nothing. It's empty. We have another question. Which of the following is not found in the nucleus of any atom? So we're looking for something that is never in the nucleus. Proton, neutron, nucleon, electron. Pause for a second. All right, answer is a D, electron. Remember, protons and neutrons collectively are known as the nucleons. Why are they called nucleons? Because they're found in the nucleus. Vocabulary. Now, here's that very, very important table that I told you about.
This one's a little bit difficult to, to read, so on the next page they make it easier. Let's zoom back out. Next slide. There we go. This one is much easier to read. Protons have a mass of 1, charge of positive 1. Neutrons have a charge of a mass of 1, a charge of 0, also called neutral or no charge. Electrons have a very, very small mass and a charge of negative 1. Now this bottom part may come up on your star. It was on the star a few years ago. It was not on last year's. It may be on yours. Nearly all of the mass is found in the positively charged nucleus. Remember, the electrons have so little mass, we don't count them when it comes to counting mass. So when we count the mass of an electron, we're just counting number of protons and neutrons. And overall, the atom itself is neutral charged because the number of protons cancel out the number of electrons. So if you have plus 3 protons and minus 3 electrons, plus 3 minus 3 gives you 0. So the whole atom is neutral, but the nucleus itself, since the nucleus has no electrons, only has positives. It's positively charged. We can skip that one. We already covered it. Okay. The atomic number. The atomic number is how you tell the name of the atom. Every hydrogen atom that exists has exactly one proton, which means its atomic number is one. If you remember Ape Man, its atomic number equals protons equals electrons. That's the ape. So atomic number, protons, and electrons are all the same number. All hydrogens have one proton, one electron, and atomic number one. Helium is two. Lithium is three. Beryllium is four. So on and so forth. Here's the same stuff, but now with carbon as the example instead of hydrogen. Every carbon atom has exactly six protons. Mass. This is the man half of ape man. It's atomic mass minus atomic number equals number of neutrons. Now, if you know anything about math and uh, a little bit of algebra, if you know any two of those numbers, you know the third one. So atomic mass, number of protons, which is your atomic number, and number of neutrons. If you know any two of those, you can figure out the third one. Just do a little bit of math. Isotopes don't really come up on the star, but just real quick. Isotopes are this uh, an, a version of the element that has the same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons. So it has a different atomic mass. A co very common one is carbon-12 and carbon-14. Carbon-12 has 6 neutrons, carbon-14 has 8. More isotopes. There we go, carbon-12, 13, and 14. 12, 14. Okay, periodic table. Now this you should have uh, been exposed to in sixth grade, because I know Mr. Negrete did this with you, but just in case, quick review. Every periodic table will have a certain amount of information, usually some combination of these four little bits, the symbol, the atomic number, the element name, and the mass number. Remember, mass may be represented as a whole number, but very commonly you'll see it as a fraction. Like instead of calling helium 4, you'll see it as 3.97 and then a long series of digits. Atomic number is always a whole number. Here's an example of the periodic table. What you need to know here is that the horizontal lines are called periods, and that tell you, tells you how many energy levels that element has. So calcium is in period 4. It has 4 energy levels to fill. And then group number, those are the vertical lines. That tells you how many electrons, uh, how many valence electrons it has. So group 1 has 1 valence electron. Group 18 has 8 valence electrons. Group 15 has 5 valence electrons. Also, some of the more common element groups that you may have heard of, such as the noble gases, right there in column 18, are grouped together uh, by group, not by period. So elements in the same group, the same column, the same vertical line have very similar properties. For instance, the noble gases don't react at all, 
and the alkali metals in group 1 react explosively. Like you'll never find them in their pure form in nature because they always bond to something else because they're so reactive. The electron structure. That's just a repetition. Protons and electrons equal each other, so the net charge of the entire atom is zero. Question. Isotopes are atoms of the same element containing the same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons. Is this statement true or false? We'll pause for a second. It is true. The electron structure. They're moving, the electrons are moving around the nucleus constantly. They never stop at, in distinct energy levels or shells. This is the 2818 concept that Mr. Negrete and Ms. Poole have been tell, talking to you guys about. The first energy level can only hold two. If there's a third electron, it doesn't fit in that first shell, so it has to move up to the second shell. When those next eight fill up, it goes on to the next one. There we go. Here's the 2818 number that we've already repeated. There we go. Electrons moving rapidly around the nucleus in distinct orbits or energy levels. The second energy level can hold a maximum of 1, 10, 8, or 18. Pause for a second. Second energy level holds 8. Remember, 18 is the third energy level and 1 and 10 are just wrong. Next answer. Next question. Reactivity and valence electrons. Uh, okay, we'll actually call this video a quit, and we'll do this in another video.